Well, how do there, chums? Tis I, Captain of the Steve, and today, chums, for you guys in the viewerverse, I'm going to be covering off a video that Professor Cynical done the other day around the multiplayer bugs. Now, as you all know, if you've played multiplayer recently or not even recently, like within the last year or so, and you've tried playing with friends, you find that it's not all that stable, or even on the platforms where it was before. It's a little bit scuppered. Anyway, let's jump on over and I'll show you what I mean. So, firstly, here's Professor Cynical's video of some of the things that he's witnessed inside of the Nexus. So here we go, let's hit play on Professor Cynical's video. Chikaboom. Whoa, did you guys see that? The anomaly literally just reloaded. Mid war, that's never happened to me before. What the heck is going on? But why? Why does that keep happening? And even... Exactly. Good question, Mr. Professor of the Cynicals. Yeah, so people just sort of disappear and reappear into the iteration inside of the Nexus, and it's happening quite a lot. It's almost like the server instance is being reset. Now, if you're in a group of players, sometimes that means one of your players disappears and doesn't come back again. They can't see you. They still remain in group. Now, this happened to us. we just run the weekend mission. We've done that successfully within nanoseconds because Wolfie is a freaking ninja. And then we got back to the actual Nexus. We started to run another, another mission and Kettle couldn't join okay, us. So we've got Miyogi, we've got Wolfie. Wait, wait, where's Kettle? I am He's wandering boring. around an empty... Yeah, I'm wandering around an empty station at the moment. A station? Why did you go to the station? Oh, We're sorry. in the Nexus, mate. The ne I'm, sorry, I meant to say Nexus. It's oh. empty. There's nobody here. Oh, no for fudge. It's always, always Kettle that always. gets this weirdness yeah. going on. Is he still in the group? Bloody underpants. Yeah, I'm still in the group. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's random, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh Okay, and it happens pretty much every week to Mr. Kettle. Poor old Mr. Kettle, he's, he's always getting fudged up and losing the group, or yeah, he gets random stuff happen to him every week, or if not Kettle, sometimes Kettle is the only one that completes the mission, and then all three of us can't com complete the mission. It's strange. We don't really know what's going on or what the cause is. However, there is a video from Hello Games. This is Ian Brown, and this is at the Develop Brighton conference. And he's uh, talking to the actual interviewer here, Harvey Eagle. What a cool name! Anyway, let's hear what Ian Brown has got to say to Harvey Eagle's probing question. Okay, so that's how you describe the game. Tell us a little bit more about how you used Azure to implement some of the cloud features inside the game. So we're a very small team. I'm generally the only person who works on the servers. So we don't want to be dealing with any kind of ops for the game. We want our servers to not be managed by us. We want someone else to do it for us. So we've gone for a platform as a service offering, which is Azure App Service. We don't have to worry about the VMs. We don't have to worry about the OS. We don't have to worry about the frameworks. We just write c -sharp code that we can upload to the, uh, the cloud, and it scales out for us. Um, and we, that was our emphasis. We just want to write the code. We don't want to be dealing with the ops side of things. And we utilize quite a lot of Azure features. We're quite heavily embedded in the Azure ecosystem. So for instance, we use Azure Key Vault as a place to uh, store all our secrets and certificates and things like that. So we don't have to let people see things that they don't need to see, any kind of secrets need to be protected, live in Key Vault, only the servers can see them. Uh, we also use Event Hub because uh, we wanted to make sure that if the database itself went down, we didn't lose anything from uh, our players. So the players don't upload their discoveries straight into our database, they upload them to Event Hub, and then we pull them out of Event Hub when the database is in a ready state and writes it into the database. This allows us to do maintenance of database, but it also smooths out the load a bit so that you don't have to instantaneously deal with uh, the submissions as they come in. And you're obviously dealing with tons of data as well, so you, you, I so, assume you have data solutions for that. So the Cosmos DB is what we use to the actual database. It's a NoSQL database that uh, is automatically managed. Again, it all scales. We just say, we want to be able to do this many requests on it. And as you manages it, it puts it wherever it thinks is best, it grows it as it needs to. 
we're about three terabytes of data in there now. Uh, it's all just JSON documents, it's all just text, so it's a lot of data. But Cosmos copes with it fine. We can do queries across all that data uh, without any issues. So the game, I think, is what, roughly five years old now? Something like that, which means you've been working with Azure for, for that period of time, for five years. I'm interested to know, how has your usage of Azure evolved over the years? So obviously the game has grown a lot in the five years since we've launched. When we launched, basically the only thing in our servers were these discoveries, the planets, the animals, the plants, the rocks. We've added quite a few more features that all have gone into the database. Uh, we've added uh, bases people can share. We've added um, settlements, which is a new thing that's gone in recently. Uh, we've added missions in that people do work on. Um, so that's grown, and the Cosmos database has grown with it, and we've just spec'd it up as it's needed. We've also migrated uh, from different hardware. When we launched, we were on version one of the hardware. Since, that's, since we've launched, there's been two new iterations of hardware within Azure. Each one has become cheaper for each of your compute. And we've just redeployed our servers onto these new versions, and it all just works. And it's just cheaper uh, without having to worry about it. And we've also, because we run on Netcore, we launched on Netcore 1, we've run on uh, .NET 5. We've also moved to Linux since we launched, and that was just seamless. It was, we redeploy to a Linux app service instead of a Windows one. The code is identical. We don't have to worry about the underlying OS the Linux machines are significantly cheaper. So we made a massive saving just by switching over to Linux with very little input from us. And can you talk a bit about how you use Slack as well? Um, we hook up uh, various things to Slack. They're internal things rather than external facing things. So for example, I use Octopus to deploy on my servers. Whenever I do an Octopus deploy of a server, it sends out a message to a Azure function, which is a serverless piece of code that's very simple. It's a webhook. It goes out, and then that writes to our Slack to say, hey, a server is start deploying. It's passed. It's failed. It's very few lines of code to write a Slack notification and just host it in an Azure function. OK. Going back to the launch, you famously had so many players at launch. Uh, incredible success. And that must have presented, I guess, some technical challenges. I'm interested to know how Azure helped you deal with basically that level of initial player interest that you had. Sure. So when we first launched, we had done a bunch of load testing. We thought we were going to be fine. We underestimated the player numbers. It, it was huge when we first launched. But also the nature of our load testing was such that we were load testing both the CPU and the RAM, but we weren't load testing the number of connections being made to each machine. And unfortunately, we ran out of those. So what we had to do is quickly jump onto the Azure portal and scale up all our servers. Uh, so we went from the least powerful machines we had to much more powerful ones that could have many more connections. And we also broadened out and uh, went on many more instances of the servers. All of this was easily done in the portal. It was just clicking a few buttons, and it was up and running. I didn't have to like requisition new hardware or anything like that. It was just go to the portal, fiddle around with some numbers until it worked. Uh, and then we got to the point, it was OK. The other thing that happened at launch was that uh, Cosmos DB used to have the, a dev offering, which was unpartitioned and cheap. And then a partitioned offering that was partitioned, but a lot more expensive. So you only want to use that for your production database. For your dev databases, use the cheap one. For our testing of the PC servers, we'd set up a dev database. We didn't want to pay for a production one for the months leading up to launch. Unfortunately, we forgot to change it over before launch. <laughs> it's a little bit of a mistake. Um, and so we started writing all these records into uh, this dev database that just wasn't big enough, wasn't going to cope. And it wasn't a case of scaling up because there used to be two separate products. Now it's all one product, but it used to be two separate products. So we had to get on the phone to the Cosmos team. And the Cosmos team were great. We got hold of the actual engineers who work on it and the project managers there. And they were like, OK, we know what to do. We're going to write a script that's going to copy all your data out of your existing database and put it into a new one we've provisioned that's much, much bigger. We'll cope with your numbers. It's fine. We will also deploy a VM for you. We will run it. We'll manage it. And we'll tell you when it's ready. And we did that for a day or two. And then all the data was copied out. 
into the new database. As new data was going into the database, it was automatically coming out and going to the new one. And at one point, we just said, right, I'm going to switch over. And with the users not noticing anything, there was no server downtime. We switched one DB to the other. And it all, it all worked. And you were having, I assume, to add resource and remove resource to, to basically cope with the fluctuating player base at that time. So we use auto-scale rules within Azure. There is a bunch of those. You can set what parameters you want. So you know, if your CPU is getting too high, it just automatically uh, deploys a new server instance for you. You don't have to worry about it. it just, and it will remove them as you don't need them. And you can specify exactly how much uh, headroom you want on a, on a VM before it upgrades or downgrades. Okay. Um, of course, one of the key objectives, really, of, of any game is keep your players happy and engaged. Are there examples you can share from the work that you've done on No Man's Sky that demonstrate how you how the cloud helped you drive player engagement? So we've recently launched a new mode within No Man's Sky, which is a time-limited seasonal mode. So for a few weeks, we'll have a new game mode that's out that you can just play and then... Uh, and then after that, you can't do it, and you get some unique rewards for doing that. We don't want people hacking the game client to unlock this mode early or seeing what's coming or whatever. So all that data lives in the cloud. It lives in uh, table storage within Azure. And then at a given time, it will be downloaded to all the clients uh, as they need it. This is all. But if you know our community, our community is still pretty good at doing the old data mining, aren't they? We usually do find out what's coming before it comes. Now, uh, set up by the designers. We've tried to remove as much as possible from needing a coder to do this. It's just a designer will set, this is the time that the season starts, this is when it finishes, this is the file that describes what it does, here's the rewards, all that kind of thing. Uh, so it's very much about empowering uh, the designers to do this so that we don't need a coder because we don't have that many coders. We're all about trying to reduce the uh, dependence on coders. We've also similarly done uh, weekend missions where uh, we encourage players to come back for a weekend to get a unique reward. They'll play together. They'll do a task together, which has a target for everyone to do. And it will allow each player to do a little bit of contribution each day. We don't want to let one player come in and just do millions of the, whatever the thing is. A little bit like the Atlantean head and also the Atlas head that we just unlocked in the last expedition of Singularity, I believe is what he's on about there, which is pretty cool. So we have a limit per player per day, but we want people to come back. And all that is done in Cosmos. We seem to have lost the audio. Seem to have lost the audio. But at this point, people, I think we're pretty good. Now, I think we pretty much understand what's going on here. If you want to see the full video of this, it's only had 126 views, and that's a year ago. So I don't believe a lot of people have seen this. If you want to see this video in its entirety, go hit it up. I'll put a link up there. However, what, we feel, what I feel I can glean from this, people, is... Hello Games have got a very small server-side team. In fact, that server-side team, according to Ian, is just Ian. Just Ian on his own. And he heavily relies on the platform that it's on, which is now Linux. But he also relies on the Azure sort of plugins, the Azure cloud. And it's just a case of they want to code, stick their code in, and Bob's your uncle, it works. So when it isn't working, when there is a problem with inside of multiplayer, is it really Hello Games' studio that's tackling the problem, or are they reaching out and getting on the phone to various companies like you mentioned with inside of this interview? I think it's probably the latter. I mean, yes, there's probably a few things that they can tweak and change internally, but they're just coding the game. Outside of that, all the sort of server sort of queries and all that sort of stuff, it sounds like it's hounded by these third parties and it's a platform as a service. Sadly, the service that we're getting as the end users, we're going to Hello Games, they're going to a third party, and you can kind of see where this could easily fall down, which it is. It's fallen on its frickin' rear, to be honest. 
It's a little odd that we're not seeing this on other games and other platforms, though. As Professor Cynical points out inside of his video, you know, roadblocks and games that haven't really got as many players turning up or, or using their server instances, he uses other, server, uh, other games as examples, and he says, you know, that their instances are stable. So whatever Hello Games is doing, I mean, you heard there that they've moved through three different iterations as well to make the costs cheaper and cheaper as they go. Have they sacrificed some of that quality that they used to have when multiplayer first went live in favour of cost? I really don't know. I don't know what's going on there, but this is all we've got to go on. And I believe it's quite a decent interview that gives a decent insight into what goes on inside of the studios. And the funny thing is, Ian actually ends off by saying, I think I might have said too much already. Um, yeah, if Tim's about, I think Tim Woolley, he might be a little bit cross. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Anyway, go hit on up that full video. I'd also put links to Professor Cynical's video during this video, it would have popped up when he was talking, uh, but I'd also put it inside the video description. So hit on up the video description. Anyway, people, that's everything I've got for you. I, I, I remain hopeful that multiplayer is going to be fixed, is what I'm getting at, but I honestly don't think it's down to Hello Games' studio so much. It looks like they've gone for platform as a service, and it's going to be those people that are offering that service that Hello Games needs to get onto, but at the same time still report all your multiplayer issues and networking faults to the Zendesk so they can then pass that on to their Azure teams and their partners that supply the multiplayer, and hopefully, hopefully, it might become stable one day, but to be honest... This has been going on for well over a year now, people, and I honestly don't think it's going to improve much past where we are now. Anyway, salute to Mondo. Cheery bye.